Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode on the podcast. I'm so excited for this one. It is with Dr. John Martini, and this is a really special one for me because when I started the podcast years ago, about six years ago, Dr. John Martini was someone in my top 10 list of people I wanted to interview. And I was very, very blessed to have sat down with him so many years ago, I think it was five years ago, and have that interview it was crazy. Got to meet him. I'd been to his seminars. I loved his work and I really loved the simplicity of what he taught. It was never about fads or uh, anything really crazy. It was the fundamentals of knowing your values and that will lead you to create a life of fulfillment. Then I got to interview him again during lockdown and that was really cool, but that was online. So there wasn't, you know, as, as, as deep as a connection you can get on uh, a screen. And then when the opportunity came around, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, wow, what a full circle moment for me to sit down with someone that I see as a mentor in my life, that I listened to a lot of his audio, read his books, went to his events, and felt I got a lot of guidance directly and indirectly from his work. So when I got to sit down with him this time, I was like, okay, I've matured, right? And there's a lot that's happened in my life. I've shared a little bit on the podcast, but you know, becoming a father and businesses and success and failure and all this sort of stuff. A lot of things have happened in that time. And I really got to come to this conversation with a lot of questions that I've held within me that I've really wanted to ask. And I don't see them as questions that normally or typically get asked to him on other podcasts or social media. So I am so happy and so grateful I got to share that time with him. He's such a genuine human being. Dr. Martini is a human behavioral expert and a teacher that has been sharing his knowledge and his processes for over 40 years around the world. His principles of what he teaches just make sense. And I love how simple he puts it, how he explains it. And in this conversation, there are just so many links between, you know, the success of your relationships how to find those values, how to bring those values into your life, how to align those values with your business, comparison, why people are so unhappy, all all these things. There is so much goodness in this whole conversation. I'm so grateful I got to share this conversation with him and that you guys get to listen to it. So I hope you enjoy. Before we kick off this episode, I want to say thank you for you for joining me on this podcast, wherever you're listening or watching. It would mean the world to me if you could subscribe and, and give a little like, it kind of helps boost the podcast and get this conversation out there. But also go across to The Conscious Podcast on Instagram, TikTok, wherever you are, and there's little clips that go out from this podcast episode. So there's some lots of value nuggets that I share, that you can share with your friends. And I see them as little seeds of impact that we can share with this world to make the world more conscious. As well as that, I have some exciting news. I've been working on this for many months now, but I finally have so many exciting things to bring into the world. I've got my program that's going to be relaunching the Conscious Blueprint, which goes in turn with this episode, because in that I teach you how to find your values and your purpose and create a life you love. On top of that, I have a series of events coming out in the new year. In 2025, there are going to be a lot of exciting events in person, online, workshops. I also have my exclusive mentorship group as well coming out. So there are so many things to look forward to and I'd love for you to be a part of it. If you value growth, if you want to step into the best version of you, I have created this community and these events to help keep you on track, to keep checking in so that we can connect deeper, elevate into a better version of us and we can empower ourselves so that we can create the life that we love. If any of that is of interest to you, I want you to join my email list. You can go to my website, www.carloscerillo.com. It'll have everything there. But also if you go forward slash community, you can enter your email and you can get updates when I start to bring all these things out. You can also find all the links to that in the show notes below. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy this episode. Why are people so unfulfilled and unhappy many times people compare themselves to other people and expect to live in other people's values instead of their own and we're not here to compare ourselves to others and put people on pedestals or pits we are here to put them in a heart but if we put them on a pedestal we'll minimize ourselves and we put them in a pit we'll exaggerate ourselves and if we exaggerate or minimize ourselves we won't be ourselves So many times the unfulfillment comes through comparison. Another aspect of unfulfillment comes from 
expecting ourselves to live outside our own values, which comes from the comparison, or having unrealistic expectations and fantasies that we impose on our life that we compare our life to. For instance, let's say you're in a relationship with somebody and you expect them to be nice, never mean, kind, never cruel, positive, never negative, peaceful, never wrathful, considerate, never inconsiderate, generous, never stingy, and all one-sided. Not going to happen. When you communicate in their values, they'll be nice as a pussycat. If you go and challenge their values, they'll be mean as a tiger. If you expect one without the other, that'd be like expecting yourself to be only one-sided. And anytime you expect others or yourself to be one-sided, you're setting yourself up for a frustration and unfulfillment. We also sometimes have f fantasies instead of real objectives. We set goals that are one-sided or goals that aren't aligned with what we value and we don't have a strategy. We have a fantasy, not a strategy that will actually achieve them. So if you expect to uh, have a million dollar or $10 million or $100 million business, but you don't have the strategy that actually will lead to that, you'll beat yourself up and wonder what's wrong with you. So set realistic expectations that are congruent with what you value, that are real objectives, not fantasies. Expect others to live in their values. Expect yourself to live in your values. Don't compare. Get focused on what you know you have control over. You have control over perceptions, decisions, and actions, nothing else. Stick to those. Those are the things you have command to create. And if you then set realistic expectations and achieve them, you'll set even greater expectations and achieve them and greater ones. And you'll just keep incrementally building momentum to do something ever greater. Hmm. And it's from last time we spoke and from watching your work and consuming your work, big focus on values is knowing your highest values because then you can prioritize your life to those values. A big question that I keep getting asked from people is, one, how do you find your values? So you've got a values determinator test. But also, do they change? And can they change? And is it, is it a matter of taking the test, but also doing the work in asking the questions to find out what they are? But can we choose values to go in our highest values that we want to focus on? The values are evolving. What you have is a priority when you're a young sibling, you know, child, is different than when you're a teen, than different when you're an adult. And so it's evolving. So I usually tell people if they want to keep current with their values to every quarter, every three months, do a value determination and make sure there's not changes. For instance, we had a woman who was in Cape Town, South Africa, who came to our program, The Breakthrough Experience, and um, she was distraught because she just had four children killed in a car crash. So she was a mother dedicated to her children in the morning. That afternoon, there were no kids. So she had what is called a punctate, cataclysmic change in values that abruptly changed the direction of her life. Most people have incremental, gradual tweakings of values as they go along and it's just gradually changing. That's why they wanna be current with it. So if there's been a really punctate uh, event in your life or some sort of gradual change, every quarter you'll probably pick it up. So I tell people to do the value determination. The value determination is a series of questions to help you be more objective about what your life is demonstrating important, not what you fantasize. I'll give you an example. I was speaking in, uh, in uh, Johannesburg, I think 2012. It's around 5,000 people sitting in the audience. And I asked, how many of you would love to be financially independent? Every hand went up. Some had two hands. Some had two hands and a foot. And I said, okay, from the parents, everybody says they want to be financially independent with their hands. How many of you are financially independent? Where well, your passive income is exceeding your active income. You're working because you love to, not because you have to. All the hands went down except seven people out of 5,000. I said, isn't that interesting? You say you want to be financially independent, but your life doesn't demonstrate it. So there's a distinction between what you fantasize and say and what you actually live. And I want to go through and make sure we have an objective data on what you're actually demonstrating in life instead of what you fantasize in life. Because if you set up fantasies, you'll beat yourself up when they're not showing up. 
If you set real objectives, you'll obtain them. And the difference between a fantasy and objective is strategic planning. So I asked him, I said, okay, I'm going to now give you 10 million U.S. dollars. Just imagine it, $10 million on a pallet, stacked up $100 increments, stacked up $10 million. And everybody's like, wow. I said, now, you have that in front of you. You also have a piece of paper with a pen next to it. You have 60 seconds to write down what you're going to do with that $10 million. So you have 60 seconds on your mark, get set. Go. What are you going to do? What are the 10 things you're going to do with that money? <sighs> they write it down as fast as they can, and they're all excited about what they're going to do with the money and everything else. I said, stop. The minute's up. Hand it to the person on the left. Whoever received that, calculate how much of that money is still an asset working and earning money. Between 20 and 80% of the money was turned into a consumable or a liability within 60 seconds, which meant that they didn't have a desire for financial independence. They had a desire for the lifestyle, the rich and famous spending money. And so what they do is confuse that activity that they see in celebrities that are spending money and having big houses and big cars and things of this nature with financial independence, which is buying assets that go up in value that appreciate in value instead of buying consumables that depreciate in value. So as long as they have that fantasy about what financial independence is and they're striving for that lifestyle, they're not going to have money working for them. They're going to be working for it. So that's the kind of thing. People have unrealistic expectations on themselves when they don't know what their real values are and they're expecting it to be something it's not. And so that's important to find out what it objectively is, what your life is really demonstrating. How do you fill your space? What do you keep most close to you? What do you spend your time on most? What exactly energizes you most? Where exactly is your money going most efficiently? Where is it going? What is actually being spent on? Where are you most organized? Where are you most disciplined? What do you think about, visualize, and internally dialogue with yourself about most that's actually coming true and there's evidence of it coming true? What are you conversing with other people about most? What is it that inspires you, that brings tears of inspiration when you get to do it? What is it that you have as goals that have been long-term, consistent, persistent goals that are coming true? And what is it you love studying about, reading about, learning about, watching on YouTube spontaneously? Those are real indicators of what you objectively value, and they may not be what you fantasize about. The fantasies are fantasies. What you really value is where you're going to excel. And that's how you're making perception, decisions, and actions according to what you value. So the value determination process the reason I put that together 46 years ago is to assist people in making sure that what they say they want is really what they want so they can obtain their objectives. And it's a matter of being honest. <coughs> like you said, like if you're being, if you're fantasizing and saying, well, I want, th I think I want that. It's, you're saying it's because people are trying to compare to someone else yes. and what they've got. Let me share a couple of stories on this. A number of years ago, I had a gentleman come to me who was a doctor, and he said, I'd like to have you consult for me. I said, fine. He said, I want you to make me successful. I want you to help me become successful. And I said, great. Where are you successful currently? He looked at me puzzled. He says, I'm not. I want to be successful. And I said, where are you currently successful? Where are you achieving what you set out to do currently? I'm not. That's the problem. I want to be successful. I'm not successful. I'm not making it clear. I'm not successful. I want to be successful. I said, I'm not making it clear that I need you to answer the question, where are you achieving what you set out to do and where are you successful currently? And he looked at me and he goes, I don't understand. I said, look in the areas of your life, your spiritual quest, your intellectual quest, your business, your finance, your family, your social, physical, where are you achieving what you set out to do? He goes, okay. I, um, I have this amazing wife. We've been getting together for 10 and a half years. Um, we are like two peas in a pod. We have this magnificent relationship. And that was a dream. And that's, I guess that's coming true. And that's, that's I'm, I, I have a success. Compared to a lot of other people in their marriages, we have a great marriage. Great. What else? Where else are you achieving what you set up? Okay, now that you make me think about it, I have a son who's 10 
who's in baseball, and I'm the coach, and we're probably going to win the pennant this year for the summer. I said, great, and you're setting out to do that, and you're achieving that. He goes, yes. Now that I think about it, yes. I wasn't focused on that, but yes. So those are achievements. What else? Well, now that I think about it further, you're making me think outside what I was thinking. My mother-in-law lives with us, and most people don't get along with the mother-in-law, and we really have this amazing dynamic. She really helps with the kids and family. She helps us. She's like a second mother, and most people would never imagine that would be working, but it, it's really great. And I said, great, what else? Well, we all work in the yard, and we're probably going to get yard of the summer, and it's a beautiful yard, and the whole family works together in the yard. And it's beautiful. We have flowers everywhere, and all the trees are trim, and everything is just really a beautiful yard. And we, as a family, work towards that. Great, what else? Well, now I think about it on Sunday and on Wednesdays, I do ministerial work and I'm at my church and I'm assisting at church. And I had a goal when I was in my 20 to be like a minister and I'm getting to do that. I said, can you see that you have achievements and areas of success in your life? The reason why you think you're not successful is you're comparing yourself to somebody else that has a different set of values. Who might that be? He said, I think I know. There's a guy up on the hill, top of the, this road, higher up, that's got a 6,000-square-foot uh, home, three-car garage, got a big practice, and, yeah, he's just, he's just knocking out of the ballpark with practice and making a fortune. I said, you're comparing yourself to him. I am. I said, Is, do you know him very well? Yep. Does he have a wife? Yep. Kid? Yep. Uh, how's his relationship with his wife? He said, that's interesting you ask that. It's quite volatile. I think they've broken up a few times. They get back together again. It's constant chaos. I mean, they're just they're screaming at each other, but they're, they're still there. But boy, they're, it's, it's volatile. Definitely would not want that. I said, and, and does he have a son? Yes. And how's his relationship with the son? That's interesting you ask it. You're real intuitive. Uh, the son has got problems in school, and he's going to counselor, and he's having to go to psychologists, and he's not wanting to buckle under and do this and he's not engaged and he's just he's he's chaotic and what about the yard do they have a beautiful yard and they, well yeah but they don't I don't think they even notice their yard they have people that take care of it that's not his focus and um, mother-in-law oh they moved out of the country to get away from her and that's part of the reasons why there's such volatility because the mother his wife is connected to the family and he doesn't want anything to do with the family and it's a lot of fighting over that and what about ministerial work? Does he do any ministerial work or something? No, he's not even into spiritual stuff. He's, he's focused on his practice, I think, seven days a week. I said, let me explain something to you. This guy is not more successful than you. He has achievements according to his values. And he obviously has a high value on business and finance. You have achievements in your highest values, which is more relationship with your family and spirituality. If you expect yourself to live in his values, you're going to end up beating yourself up. Just like if he was expected to live in your values, he'd beat himself up. So anytime we compare ourselves to others and they have a different set of values and we're expecting to live in their values, we're going to have futility and we're going to self-depreciate to let us know that we're inauthentic doing that. We're playing imposter. We're trying to be somebody we're not. We're trying to envy and imitate others instead of be authentic to ourselves. Now, if there was a change in your values, I could change their values, but in the process of doing it, you're probably now going to have less time for the family, less time for the, the, the spirituality, anything else. Are you sure you really want that? Are you willing to give up the things you have now for the things you say you want, which requires a change in values? He said, let me think about that. He said, I would like to have a little bit more income. I said, that's fine. Then what you need to do is we need to link the action steps that have been proven to produce income which is serving more people and more effective and efficiently and taking portions of that and investing it and do the action steps to build wealth and now ask, how is it going to help you with your children? How is it going to help you with your spirituality? How is it going to help you with your yard? How are you going to help? If you can see those actions on the way and not interfering with what you want, you'll do them. But you're not going to do them if you see them in the way. And right now, I'll bet that if something happened and you had a baseball game, you would stop your practice to go to your baseball game because it's important for you to do it. He says, I will do that. I do that. I make sure I take that afternoon off. I said, because of that, the man that has a high value on that wouldn't do that. He would tell his son to go get the coach. <laughs> He's working. So 
people often don't honor their values. If they want to change their values, they have to write down and stack up the advantages of the action steps that are proven to achieve the thing that they now say they want, more business, more wealth, more exercise, and stack up the benefits. And when the advantages of doing these new activities are higher than what they are currently at, and they're greater than the options you have at that moment, you'll do them. But you make decisions based on what will be the greatest advantage or disadvantage at any moment in time according to what you value. So either set goals that match your values to have fulfillment or change your values to match your goals to have fulfillment. But don't expect something that's outside your values. You won't stay committed to them. That last part. Set your values to match your goals. So that would mean then changing... You can shift the values by yeah. changing the associations on it so you have an increasing probability of doing it. Yep. Now, I could give an example of that. Yep. Um, had a gentleman in Denver, Colorado, came to an evening talk. Uh, he also a doctor. I, I interacted Love with doctors, thousands of yeah. doctors over the years. <laughs> and um, he and his wife were at the program, the little presentation I did that night, and they asked if they could do a consult the next day. So they came to my hotel, and we had went to my suite there, and, and uh, the wife spoke. She says, um, she cried. She says, I married a doctor. I can openly say that I did expect a little bit higher standard of life than what we have. We've been together 10 years, just like this other doctor. And I really did expect that we'd have a, a nice house, some nice cars, nice things. And I don't mean to be superficial, but I just wanted that life. And no matter what, he's just struggling financially. And I'm, I, I, it breaks my heart because I love him, but I don't want to live this way the rest of my life. So I'm caught. Is there anything you can help us with? Because I don't want to leave my husband. I don't want to destroy my family. But I just can't seem to give up the idea and the belief that we could have more. So I turned to him and I said, sounds like you're in a bit of a predicament. He goes, yeah, he's really feeling bad about himself. I said, um, we had determined his values. It was spirituality, metaphysics, natural healing. And there was no reference to anything on business and money. So she had an assumption because he was a doctor label that that would be just a coming with it. So that was her lesson in selection. But his love was those things. And no matter what he does, he makes just enough money to be able to attend the seminars on spirituality, to do the meditation retreats, <clears throat> to make sure that basic bills are paid. But outside that, that's not his high value. And she's not working because she's got the kids. And she thinks that she deserves to have a man that will take care of that. So her expectation is not unreal. There's somebody out there that would be glad to do that. His are not unreal for his values, but she had an expectation for him to live in her values, and she's, he's expecting her to understand his values. And this is, where, this is where a lot of conflicts come in, when people project their values onto each other instead of learning how to communicate what they value in terms of the other person's values. So I said the predicament you have now is, is an option. You could say goodbye to your wife and your children, and you could just embrace that and love yourself and, and find somebody that has less ambition for lifestyle and go on spiritual retreats and things like that. You have that option. Or you have an option of having a shift in values. You know, love, love who you are or have a shift in values and change the direction. What would you prefer? He said, well, if I could shift my values and become more viable and still be spiritual, that would really be great. I said, well, first of all, your idea of spirituality is some sort of box you bought into, that somehow spiritual is not material and spiritual is not prosperous and things of that nature. So as long as you inject that value system in your life and you've got an internal conflict about becoming very fortunate, you'll think that there's some sort of non-spirituality associated with it, which is not true. There's spirituality and where is God not, as they say. You know, as Guru Nanak says, where is it not? It's all spiritual. So I sat down and I made him look at how is building his business and seeing more patients and managing his business and money more efficiently, how could that help him become more spiritual? And we made about 20 or 30 links. How is that going to allow him to do his meditations? 
And, I, and, and then how is that also going to make him more inner calm? And he says, well, the calm will come by making sure I've got something for my family because that's where my stress is, the conflict. And we've made st- stacked up association in his brain. So his brain, when he thinks of spirituality, it doesn't exclude doing the things that build business and money. But now it's now inclusive, not exclusive. And when, within about an hour and a half, we were able to make enough links until he brought, was brought to tears, realizing that actually building his business and seeing more clients and becoming more proficient would allow him to attend more classes also and also take care of the things for his wife. And it, you, you would think it was logical, but it wasn't until I actually made the links. Once he made the links and he had his tears of realization, his wife was in tears. She hugged him because she now saw a possibility of maybe some change and hope that maybe someday they could work towards this. In three months from that consult, his income went up, his business went up. He wiped out $30,000 worth of debt. He paid it off. They celebrated. And then we organized, I worked with him again. We organized a long-term plan on, on the house that he dreamed about and she dreamed about. It was more than her dream usually is more her dream but his dream was to be able to provide it and so we started a a savings program an accelerated savings an investment program and put together monies away for taxes and we started to allocate it properly we started to make him realize that that's only an extra four to five patients a day that's all it was to be able to have that we started to concentrate on it. We started to figure out how to be more efficient and delegate some things and how to market more efficiently. And he made his objective. He worked. It was two years before they had the house, but they saved and invested the money where the passive income was starting to grow and they had enough money for the down payment. And that way they weren't just overwhelmed by a mortgage payment. At the end of two years, they got the house. They end up also scheduling, scheduling money for the house, they're scheduling money for a vacation with the family, education for the family. We restructured his financial responsibilities, and we also gave him the, the, the ability to go into his spiritual retreats, meditation. But what happened is he changed the people who was associating with spirituality away from people that were ideas that money is evil. And we got him into spiritual constructs that were more inclusive. And his life is different today much different today. So we could change the value systems by making links and associations and brain with the action steps that actually help you get what you want. Or we can embrace who you are and say goodbye to the family and go back and be a a monk. And and, and and either one is fine. I'm not attached to which one. I just want to make sure they find out which one they want. Mm. Which one are they willing to do? I'm not attached to if they decide <clears throat> divorce and let her find a wealthy guy and him go out and be a monk and do spiritual things. Great. I have no problem where they want to go. I just want to make sure that they're doing something that fulfills their life. Yeah. And I guess that comes down to like individually knowing what those values are. What and those then, values are or what are you willing to do to shift the values? To shift the values if you want to then come together. If that's important. And it yeah. was in his case. Yeah. Because I see that like... You know, I can think back of past relationships and stuff where I guess <laughs> after attending your events and talking to you, I kind of went out going, I've got to find someone that values the same things I value. Is that the approach that we should be going for when we're dating or looking for that mate? No. Okay. Because uh, again, you're we're not going to be that. unique. Okay. You're not going to get it. If any two people are exactly the same, one's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you would probably, there was a, there was a show when I was a kid. I'm 70, so when I was a kid, uh, called the Twilight Zone. <laughs> and the, there's a guy that comes down in his high-rise apartment in New York. And as he c- comes down the elevator, he meets a lady at, th- at the greeting at the, at the ground floor. And he was disgruntled by her attitude. And then he goes and gets in a taxi, and he was disgruntled with the attitude of the taxi driver. And then he gets to his office and he's disgruntled with the office receptionist. Then he goes up to his office. He's disgruntled with his office uh, private secretary. Then he's disgruntled with another person that's a colleague of his. Then he goes to lunch and he's disgruntled with the person that's his waiter. Then he comes back to work and he's disgruntled with one of his clients. Then at the end of the day, he's disgruntled with the person who cooked the meal at the restaurant he was at. And then he came back and said, why? 
on earth are people so idiots? I wish they would just be sensible like myself. So he wakes up the next morning and everybody's him. <laughs> everybody's him. They're all in his body with different outfits on mm. as women or men, but it's all him. And his attitude is in every one of them. At the end of the day, that was the most torturous day of his life. <laughs> More torturous than having everybody different. And he said, please, bring me back to the way it was. So we have this fantasy that if everybody had exactly our value systems, we would be supported and it would be great. But we don't grow maximally at the, at the support. We become juvenilely dependent on things that support us. We become precociously independent on things that challenge us. But maximum growth and development occurs at the border of support and challenge. We need both. If, you get a, if, a, if a girl gets a guy that says, whatever you want to do, honey, just, whatever you, just tell me what you want to do. I just want to do everything you want me to do. I just want to please you. She's going to end up just torturing the guy. Stand up to me. Have, a, have some testosterone. Be a man. She's not going to want that. And if he's the other extreme and just telling her what to do and demanding, he's going to, she's not going to want that either. She wants somebody that gives them support, her, her support and challenge and can banter with them with positive and negative responses to make sure that she's authentic. Because if he supports her and puts her up, that's not authentic. Puts her down, not authentic. But puts her there and keeps her in check with a balance of support and challenge, we have authenticity. So people are looking for somebody that has a balance of similarities and differences. The ancient Greeks wrote about this in the time of Aristotle. If you see more similarities and differences, you're infatuated. If you see more differences and similarities, you're resentful. If you see a balance of similarities and differences, you have love. And that's what you're going to get. You're going to be finding somebody that has a balance of support and challenge. So you can delegate low priority things in your values to her because she will have that on her values. And she can delegate the lower priority things in her life to you because that's what's highest on yours. And you work as a team, mutually assisting, having agreements and disagreements and peace and war and positive and negative and support and challenge and nice and means and hugs and slugs. Welcome to love. Going to be a balance of both. <laughs> and it came up before. I didn't, didn't say it. The, when we talk about shifting your values, for you, did your values shift when you had children? I can't say that my overall overarching desire to teach, travel, heal, and that didn't stop. Uh, I, I definitely had some shifts in values, but I can't say that the overall arcing main values in my life stopped. I just found ways in which I could incorporate the children into that mission that I was on. Because I've been on a mission since I was 17. Yeah. I'm a man on a mission with a vision and a message, as I say. So none of those have changed. I um, probably did not spend the time that many people fantasize about being with kids because I was traveling a lot. But if you ask my kids, and they've been interviewed many times, what was it like to have a dad like this? They will tell you there's things that they liked and things that they disliked, things they wouldn't change, things they wouldn't love to have changed. And most parents have children that would say that same thing. So I think that they got advantages and disadvantages by my dynamic. I'm not right or wrong for my dynamic, but we sometimes have this, uh, as John Dewey said, um, we, we, we're supposed to be, it's like an is versus ought. You know, we're, we're, or D D David Hume also said that. There's an is and ought. This is the way it is, and this is the way it ought to be. And people get trapped comparing with the way it is to what it ought to be. And honoring the way it is and quit comparing it to the way it ought to be according to some fantasy allows you to appreciate your life. And that's what I try to teach people to do. Uh, I ask people that are having conflicts and relationships sometimes. Uh, so what do you dislike about your, your wife or your husband? Well, they do this. Okay, that means you're perceiving more challenge and support, more negatives and positives. How is it actually a benefit to you that they're doing that? Well, it's not. Well, as long as it's not, you're going to want to fix them. And that's important to them. And you're trying to fix them. And you're not loving them for who they are. And they're going to find somebody else that will if you don't. So how does it help you? I can't see it. Well, if you don't see it and you don't want to know it, 
then you're going to want to be self-righteously projecting your values, trying to fix them. And you're now in love, not with them, but with a fantasy figure about who you're going to make them. And they're not going to fit that. And they're going to end up finding somebody that wants them for who they are. And then you're going to learn a lesson about if you don't, if you're not able to love them for who they are, they're going to find somebody else that does. Anything you're not willing to do for your mate, you're going to, have to be willing to delegate because somebody else is going to come into your, their life. So I help them see the benefits of who they are. When they see the benefits of who they are and they start to love them for who they are, the person turns into who you love. Mm. And that's a big wake-up call for most people. And does that also happen internally? Because I know one thing that you shared last, the first time we spoke, was the Delphic Oracle of know thyself, love thyself, be thyself. And, and for me, that really impacted me. And I went away, researched it, and also brought that into my teachings when I do my seminars and events. And is that part of the process, do you think, of people... It says it in the in know thyself, love thyself, be thyself... Is that part of that process of people starting to love themselves and live a life that they want to live? Your highest value in your hierarchy of values, the thing that you spontaneously do that nobody extrinsically has to tell you to do or force you to do or motivate you to do, you just spontaneously do it. In my case, teaching. Whatever that highest value is, your ontological identity revolves around it. So if your highest value is being a mother and you have three beautiful children under the age of five, and you're 35 years old, and somebody asks you, who are you? You'll say, I'm a mother. Somebody came up to me and said, who are you? I'm a teacher. That's what I do. Now, we could get metaphysical and say, well, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm a soul. I'm a, we, we, but the reality is what you do has a lot to do with who you identify yourself by. So... If I ask that, I also found out that that highest value is what they feel their teleological purpose is about. So they feel that that's what their purpose is. It's who their identity is. And the area where they have the greatest epistemological knowledge, the area of expertise is always the highest value. So where you excel in knowledge and know the most and are most um, advanced in your expertise is in your highest value. What your identity ontologically is, is your highest value. Your teleological purpose, highest value. So know thyself is the epistemological. Be thyself is the ontological. And love yourself is when you get to do what you love and love what you do every day, teleologically, you feel you have a meaning and purpose. You love your life. So you have a fulfilled life. So the Delphic Oracle was saying that because it was describing the telos. Now, Aristotle called the telos, that is the name for what he called the highest value. And the telos, the study of that was teleology, which is a study of meaning and purpose. So the most inspired spontaneously, the most purposeful, the most ontological identity, the most purposeful, most meaningful, most fulfilling action is to prioritize your life and stick to the thing that's highest in priority and do that one thing and master it and delegate the rest away. And that's the mastery of life. And people will not master life and have fulfillment and appreciation and love for their life unless they are really doing what they really feel called to do. That's the calling. That's, when you're doing that, your, your blood glucose and oxygen goes into the forebrain, activates the medial prefrontal cortex, allows you to have objectivity and balance instead of subjectivity and disorientation, and allows you to be present. And your most inspired, present, purposeful, You'll have gratitude, love, inspiration, enthusiasm, certainty, and presence when you're living by your highest value. And you're now feeling you're being yourself, your authentic self, mm-hmm. your soul, if you will, the state of unconditional love, the soul. Because you'll love your life and you won't have any grits because you're doing what you love. Mm. And I think that with people around me and, and some of my clients, um, some that are mothers, they've said that when they became a mother, that became their purpose the thing that they they really want to do and they felt that i guess in a world where there's so much noise and there's uh, a lot of new gurus and, and new information and people saying you should do this you should do that you need to have a business in order to reach fulfillment whatever these people or people that i know that are coming in and saying well being a mother is now my purpose like the rest is great but and i'm looked after in terms of financially whatever but that's the thing and for me it was a struggle at the time because i played soccer for 20 years played in europe I came back and went, that was my purpose. And then it was the kind of the identity crisis of like, that was just something I did and I enjoyed doing, but I also did it because everyone else expected me to do it. And I kind of expected myself to do it. 
then when I came back and went, well, maybe it's, it's not that. And that's when I met yourself and had these conversations and went, okay, there is other values that I can step into. I feel like it is becoming more aware to people that like your purpose isn't necessarily your business. Not always. Rose Kennedy, I, I was uh, in practice many years ago and I had a lovely patient, a woman who came to me and she handed me a book. And she said, Dr. Martini, I'd like to give you this book as a gift. I said, thank you. A very intriguing book, about 100 years old. And I said, um, tell me about this book. And she said, well, my father gave it to me before he passed. And he received it from the Kennedy family. And I said, wow, that's, insp- that's inspiring. So this came from the Kennedy family. This was in the Kennedy family's home. And I was flipping through it that night, and I found a handwritten mission statement, purpose statement, by Rose Kennedy. And it said, I dedicate my life to raising a family of world leaders. So a mother can make a massive difference in the world with a mission like that. So you can have a change in values, therefore a change in what's a mission at this point. It's not necessarily for a life mission. Mine happens to be pretty steady for the last 52 years as teaching. But some people, it's for 10, 20 years, and then there's a shift that goes on. I'm not attached to that. But whatever is highest on your value is going to be it at that moment. And finding out what that is is meaningful. And to prioritize what that is until there's a shift. And there could be a shift. It could be a cataclysmic shift. You could get, have a baby and family. You could have a new career. You can move. Something can happen. You could have a shift. And if so, your mission and purpose now has expanded. I always say that your, your life's journey is made out of a series of destinations. And the hierarchy of your values is telling you what your destiny is until there's a shift in value. and The destinations change and it's moving. Now, some people know what it is and it's steady throughout their life. Some people, there's a few variations. Neither one of them are right or wrong in the process. Not a moral issue. It's just a matter of what it is and being honest and integral and keeping up to date with what is deeply meaningful to you so you're living a meaningful life. That's the key in the, in the mission. But finding out what that is and prioritizing that and living according to that, I am certain, <laughs> I've been doing this, that part 46 years, I'm certain there's more fulfillment living congruently with that than any other thing you're going to do. Yeah. I think that big part, like the right and wrong, is where even myself I got caught up in and that then comes from the comparison and, and also listening who I was consuming and who I was listening You're to. You're subordinating to somebody else's authority. Yeah. Anytime, anytime we compare ourselves to others and put them on a pedestal, we're going to inject some of their values into our life and cloud the clarity of our own mission. Yeah. And uh, there are, everyone around you, everybody, your family, your parents, everybody is projecting their values onto you. And you're constantly being bombarding and... The whole world is wanting you to fit into what they value. And you have the courage, as Jung says, uh, do you have the courage to be yourself in a world that wants you to be other than yourself? And that's the key. That's why knowing objectively what they are is important. Because if you don't want to know what they objectively are and you keep fantasizing about what they are and then you keep trying to be something you're not, you'll procrastinate, hesitate, frustrate, and you'll feel like something's wrong. Why am I not doing it? Why am I sabotaging? Why don't I have focus? Why can't I be disciplined? And all this judgment on yourself because you're trying to be somebody you're not. Mm. I don't have that in my life. I don't live that way because I'm clear about what it is and I stick to it. And I've delegated everything else. I prioritize my life. I've delegated everything other than the four things I do. Teach, research, write, travel. I don't have anything else on my plate. There's nothing else for me to do. I don't. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I haven't driven a car in 35 years. I've got a captain, I've got a pilot, I've got concierge, I've got everything to take care of everybody else, everything else. And when people come up to me and said, you should do this, I say, I should, according to who? <laughs> you ought to do this. I ought to do this, according to who? Hmm. So are they are my, are they, you're trying to say that they're my authority? I'd rather have the whole world against me than my own soul. My own authority is within. I'm the author of my destiny, Otherwise, I subordinate to outer authorities, which become the author of my life and scatter me and distract me from my mission. I think that distraction, though, is a big one in in today's world. And I I don't, I can't picture you sitting at home at night scrolling through TikTok. I just don't think that's a thing that you, unless you do. I've never done a TikTok. Okay, there you go. Well, (laughs) so for for myself, you know, I'm in my 30s and, and, you know, I was telling you about the past 18 months of 
some things that have happened. I noticed for me, when I was doing this, three, five years ago, started doing it, it then led to creating a program, then creating events and seminars and workshops around Australia. Thing that I love doing as well is teaching. Then I started listening to other people saying, yeah, you should monetize it in this way. You should, it should be a paid community. It should be this. It should be, oh no, you have to do it in a one day seminar, not an eight week program. Um, it has to look like this. It, 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 and I just got so, I went, okay, well, they're more successful than me. So I'm going to listen. And it kind of took me off that path and it became pressure and money. Obligation and love. duty instead of design. Well, I can't say that I, I do read extens extensively. Yeah. And I try to read the greatest ideas from the greatest minds I have. But I also know that for everything, and there's a thing called a dialectic in philosophy, that there's a proposition and an opinion, and there's an equal and opposite proposition and opinion. And whenever I see an opinion, I look for the opposites, and I find the medium between them. Because otherwise, I'll be distracted by other people's opinions instead of following my own objectives. I find myself, if I compare myself to others, Instead of compare my daily actions to my own highest values, I don't do as well. But if I compare how am I doing relative to what my primary objective is, am I doing the highest priority actions on a daily basis, then I'm doing the most any human being can do. And I stick to those. I've, and I learned what they are, and I've delegated everything else but that, so I don't have to do anything but the highest priorities today. And everybody has capacity to do it. People come up to me and say, well, that's because you're financially independent. No, I do became financially independent when I did that. That was the difference. And people have it backwards. They think, well, if you have wealth, you can do it. You can delegate. I delegated, and that's how I got wealthy. And does that come back to be, do, have, instead of have, do, be? Well, I do all more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a teacher. I do teaching, yeah. and I have the opportunity to watch people be taught. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. One thing, I came to one of your events. I can't remember which one. It might have been... Gratitude experience? Was that something you were sharing alive? I, I had a book Possibly. out, Gratitude Effect. Mm, it, was, it wasn't the breakthrough experience, but it was something else that I came to. It was probably 10, 12 years ago. Maybe an evening event or something? Possibly. Yeah. I've got photos of it. And there was something you spoke about then, which was, in life, keep your lows high and your highs low yeah. so that you're in here and your, your emotions aren't kind of, you know, yo-yoing up and down. Now, for me, how I internalized that was don't, you're going to have rock bottoms, you're going to have very um, intense, sad, grief, heartbreaks, all these things. If you can kind of level it and be like, this is terrible, it's happening, I'm feeling it, but I'll be okay, it kind of lifts you back up there. When I tried explaining it to people, they were like, oh, but then you'll be in here and you'll be flatlining and you'll be like, it's almost like dead, you won't feel anything, any joy or any sadness. You won't feel your emotions. How do you then explain that? Well, they're unaware of how physiology works, that's all. <laughs> uh, there's a, a part of the brain uh, called the amygdala. And whenever you get a stimuli, the amygdala, based on whatever's stored in the associated areas of the brain and what they once called the subconscious mind, the hippocampus, uh, takes that new stimuli and associates it with things of the past and it assigns a valency to it. Is it something that's prey or predator, something positive or negative? And it assigns valency, which is a positive or negative charge on it. If it's a positive charge, it now has an impulse towards. If it has a negative charge, it has an instinct away. And we're an automaton reacting to the perception that we have. Now, if we perceive really a lot of positives, we get elated. We see a lot of negatives, we get depressed. Now, we have inside our brain homeostatic mechanisms to bring us back into balance. So if we get really elated, like the first time you kiss a girl the first night, right? You, you kiss them for 45 minutes or something like that. The next night's 43 minutes, next night's 41, next night's 39, 37. It just, it calms down and calms that down. And that's called hedonic adaptation. And if it's really negative, it's called desensitization. But it's a form of hedonic treadmill. They call it the hedonic treadmill or the hedonic paradox. Hedonic means pleasure seeking. So the second you try to go above equilibrium, you have forces to bring it back into equilibrium. The second you go below, it has forces to go back up. It's homeostatic, just like a thermostat it, in your body, the hypothalamus. It has a regular thermoregulatory system. If it gets hot, you sweat. If it gets cold, you shiver. And it's a homeostatic mechanism to keep you at 98.6 something de degrees. 
Now, the psychology is done that way. But people want one-sidedness sometimes. They want happy without sad. They want pleasure without pain, which is fool. That's, a, that's by definition foolishness. Because they're trying to get a magnet with one pole. Mm-hmm. And anytime you try to get that which is unobtainable and trying to avoid that which is unavoidable, you create suffering. You create futility. And so people, the more people are wanting a one-sided world, the more volatile they become and unstable. Bipolar condition is a byproduct of monopolar addiction, the addiction to one side. When you embrace both sides, see both sides, and have regulation and dampen that, which is what the executive center does to the amygdala, it calms it down. It uses glutamate and GABA to calm down those, those swings, to stabilize yourself so you're poised. A person who's poised is present, is purposeful, is patient, productive, prioritized, and empowered. Now, when people say there's this flat line, there's no feeling, it's not true. If you take the highs and lows and synthesize them and put them into balance, you end up with gratitude, love, inspiration, enthusiasm, certainty, and presence. And I've done that in about 125,000 people and shown that. You don't lose feeling. You just take bipolar feelings, joy, sorrow, happy, sad, admire, despise, like, dislike, infatuation, resentment, and synthesize and put them into gratitude, love, inspiration, enthusiasm, and certainty and presence where you perform most. Now, anybody knows that when they get really manic or depressed, they're unstable. Moder- you have what they call cyclothymia, which is little mood swings. You get bipolar. You get dissociations and schizoid behaviors. Or you become stable. And people are stable. Those vacillations are less extreme. If they're perfectly dead center, you'll get tears of inspiration. Because when you're elated, that means you're assuming there's more support than challenge, activating the parasympathetic system, activating delta waves in the brain. And if you go and you get something that challenges you, you'll get the sympathetic activity and you'll get beta waves in the brain. But if you get in balance, you'll get alpha theta waves in the brain, which will create gamma synchronicities in a moment of aha, eureka, and authenticity with tears in the eyes. That's the place where you maximize your performance. And that's easily demonstrated and proven through history. So I found when I was about uh, 30, I found out when I had, when I was 32, 32, 33, I was 1986, 87. I noticed that if I had a big day in the office and I'd be elated and I'd be all proud and thinking, wow, I did an amazing job today. Well, I'm I'm cool. I'm special. That if I'd drive home all proud like that, I'd come home and my wife would nail me and cut me down and then just slam me. And I thought, she's toxic. I'm a king. I'm special. And she'd humble me to level the playing field in the family. Then I would be upset, I'd be angry, I'd not sleep very well, I'd go back to work, I'd have a crazy day, I'd have a down day, and I'd go, oh, what a day. And I'd come home and then she'd support me and massage my back. And, and I was noticing that whenever I was up, she was bringing me down, whenever I was down, she was lifting me up. And I thought, my addiction has been to be up and I'm trying to avoid the pain and try to seek the pleasure, I'm trying to get a one-sided world and I'm becoming unstable. I think, I wonder what would happen if I used my brains and used my executive center to calm myself down. So what I did is at the end of the day, instead I would go home, I would actually sit there in the office, watch the sunset, and ask a series of questions. When I was puffed up and feeling all elated, and how great I am as a doctor, what patient's name did I forget? What anniversary did I forget? What birthday did I forget? What staff member did I not thank? What procedure did I overlook? And I ask a series of questions to calm myself down. Because if you don't govern yourself, the world on the outside has to kick your butt to govern you. And people that govern themselves with their physiology and psychology are masters. And people that have to be governed by their sociology and theology are masses. And it's a difference. They're outer directed instead of inner directed. So I noticed that if I came home and I brought myself, before I went home, if I brought myself back down until I had a tear and I was authentic and I was grateful for my staff and great for my patients and great for my family. And when I came home, I had an amazing wife waiting for me that was absolutely amazing and inspired. If I was down, I said, whoa, what a day. And if I asked who did I serve, what birthdays did I remember? And I asked reverse questions and bring myself back up. I had a stable, stable home and, and I noticed that she was reflecting what I was not governing. She was giving me feedback as a loving wife but I was not mature enough to get that. I also noticed that when I monitored my stats, that when I was trying to go to one side and be 
proud and infatuated and elated all the time and peak that my volatilities were all over the place in my business, the second I governed myself, my stability of my practice went up and I grew more. So don't let somebody say, well, they won't have feelings. You'll have feelings of gratitude, love, inspiration, enthusiasm, certainty, and presence. And Peter Lynch, in his book, One Up on Wall Street in the 90s, said something really important. He said, after I do my quantitative and technical analysis and determining the stocks I'm going to invest in, he said, I go and get on the private jet and I fly over to the headquarters of the company and get a walk around and meet all the people and get a sense for the, the people in the company. He says, if they're grateful for their job, they're loving what they're doing, they're inspired by the vision, they're enthusiastically working, they're certain about their skill, and they're present when they do it, I buy the company because that company's going and appreciating in value. I found the same thing in my own life. Mm. And is it the same for experiences? So let's say someone's going through a, a you know a terrible rock bottom experience, a, a divorce or a, a, a death in the family, or you know people because I've had people comment on my TikToks where I share clips of this uh, from the podcast, and people will just write Palestine, and I'm like, There's, that's no not relevant to what this person's saying, but these are things that are happening. How do, how do we then? Is it called neutralizing? Like bringing that, you say synthesizing. No, what, what, I mean, we could call it that, but let me just put it this way. There are no terrific or terrible events. There's only events. People don't get that. They live in a delusion, moral hypocrisies about things that have been labeled. But every event is neutral until somebody comes along with a different perception and perspective an expectation, and they give it a label. They think it's terrible or terrific. So to one person, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a drone striking to an a, uh, Iranian general with Trump four years ago, and he killed one of their leading, Soleimani, they killed one of the leading things. In America, they were celebrating that they got rid of one of the leading terrorists. In Iran, they were mourning. Five million people went out and mourned in the streets over the loss of their leading general. That man was not a terrible man or a terrific man. He was not a villain. He was not a hero. He was a human being. He's neutral. But when they do things that challenge our values, we call him a villain. When they do things that support somebody else's value, they call him a hero. And that's the same thing with events in life. We can make a heaven out of a hell, as Milton said, or a hell out of a heaven based on the thinking and the way we ask questions and see. So when we're seeing it as a terrific event, we're conscious of the upsides. We're unconscious of the downsides. We're blind. If we think it's a terrible event, we're conscious of the downsides. We're unconscious of the upsides. We're blind. If we see both sides, we use the event to fuel an opportunity to do something extraordinary with that event. So if somebody has a death in the family or a loss in something, that doesn't mean that there has to be evil or terrible or that doesn't mean any of those things. It could be an opportunity. I'll give an example. <clears throat> a number of years back, I had a gentleman who was 23 years old that got in a car crash and died. The parents contacted me and asked me to do a consult with them to try to help them deal with the grief because I developed grief processes. And the whole family came and met me in Dallas, Texas, because I was going to Dallas the next day. I said, I'm coming to your city tomorrow. Meet me after I do my presentation in the morning, and we'll meet at lunch. <clears throat> So they're sitting there mourning and grieving and everything else like that. And I basically said, all right, so let's make a list of everything that we admired about our son that we now miss. There's nothing listed that they didn't like about the son. There were times when the son was in irritation and frustration and things they didn't like, but you never list that when you're grieving because there's a relief. You don't have to deal with that. There's only a grief over the things that you lost that you were admiring. So we made a list of all the things they admired about their son. I pointed out the things they disliked because then they realized, oh, yeah, but I'm not grieving that. Isn't that interesting? I'm not grieving that part, right? I'm grieving the part that I admired. So I've selected the parts that I admired suddenly, <clears throat> and now I'm, I'm having withdrawal symptoms from the dopamine that these, these perceptions give me. I then asked, who is now providing those since this happened? Because he just died yesterday. Who's providing that? And we helped him see it. We asked when he was providing those behaviors, what are the downsides? Because they were infatuated with traits and we leveled the playing field. And then what's the benefit of the new people doing it? 
and we leveled the playing field. And now all the family is now, instead of grieving, they're having tears of gratitude, feeling the presence of him, and they're having this internal dialogue right there in a lobby of a hotel, appreciating him, feeling his presence. The moment they did, they decided that one of his dreams was to open up a meatball uh, manufacturing company, of all things, because they were, they were cooks and chefs or whatever. And so they decided to create a meatball manufacturing company in his name, and they built it, and they became extremely viable and made more money than they ever had in their life, and they had a picture of him in it, and it was his inspiration and his passing that birthed that thing and brought the family together. And in the process of doing that, his sister got pregnant and a son and named the son after him. And so he was now, in a sense, reborn and was now part of the thing, and it was part of the future business ownership. So there's, there's, we can see devastation or we can say inspiration. It's all the way we ask the question because the quality of our lives based on the quality of the questions we ask. And if the questions we ask make us conscious of things we were unconscious of that we were blind to, we see both sides. And then we transform events into something that's tra- transformative and inspiring. I love that. And I know you, you're, you've got uh, things to go to. I want to say thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing all of that and for being able to dissect those things. They're questions that I've been holding into and I've been watching your other content and being like, I'm still holding on to this for so many years and I, when I get that chance, I'm going to ask. Um, and just acknowledge that like, you've been doing what you've been doing for such a consistent time. I don't, like, again, I was saying before, there's a lot of new age gurus, there's a lot of influencers that are regurgitating a lot of information from... Um, people that I would say are the the leaders of the generation before, which I I feel like you're in. And they're, it's almost, I I grew up with Zig Ziglar, Bob Proctor, yourself, Tony Robbins, reading those books and listening to those audios. And that for me, John Maxwell, now coming into it, it's like I'm, I'm starting to go back to all your work and their work because that didn't have the flashy new terms and all these things that I think almost distract people from the simple and the basic things. So I love the work that you do and I'm, I'm so grateful that I've been able to sit with you three times, technically twice in person. But to see that you're, you're sharing the same message, you, you haven't diverted onto something completely different because you know it's the new thing that's happening. You, you've been saying the straight thing since day one or, or since you've started sharing it and from a student, it's like I, it's really refreshing to be able to see that. So thank you, thank you for your time as well. Thank you. It's uh, been my dream since I was seventeen to do what I do, and fifty-two years later, here I'm doing it. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for the opportunity to be on your show again. Awesome. Thank you so much. 